blow up with the music on the house. Yeah, perfect. That's 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 amazing. Can you give me more noise on uh, EV3 and lead mic?
Dave, um, we're just going to set the in-ears because uh, they're not feeling the sound more better than how it is the side. Yeah, 
Electronic guitar. What microphone are you? What channel is that? Um, electronic guitar. Draw now.
BV3, testing one, two. Put me on BV2. There's some feedback here. Oh, no. One. Kill some testing pop. One, two. Can you hear me? Can can you kill me off the bongos? <laughs> ah, sorry. I asked you to kill me off the bongos. I did ask you to kill me off the bongos. Am I off? Bongos, twenty. What channel are you plugging into now? So, kill the phantom power. On, kill the phantom power on this mic. What channel is that microphone? One, two. Okay, it's too loud. Kill the gain. One, two, two. Yeah. Let a bit of gain. One, one. Yeah. One, two, two, two. Yeah. Two, two. I've got nothing on the lead mic. Lead mic one, two, 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 two. Nice. Can you check the bass? Can you bass? Play, play. Can you play? The bass. Can you play? Yeah, they were just figuring it out. Sure. Is it coming on a house? No, it's a plugged in. Is it so amp plugged in? Can you switch it off, off that speaker? Switch it off that speaker. No, s s s okay. Subscribe help. Uh, champion, get back to the desk, please. Dave, back to the desk. Are you using in ears? I'm still not getting amp. I'm not still not getting the bass. Yeah, sorry. We just want to set up the in ears for the drummer and the bass. Sure. Where's the, where, where's your in ears? You don't have. Ah, then I can't help you. No, we don't supply them. <laughs> Bro, they don't have in ears, eh? Later when they're going to use it for something. Just thinking.
Uh, good evening. Well, evening. Let me leave the good out of this. Um, uh, thank you for being here. I would just like to ask uh, if people who are at the back could move forward. Um, I've been reminded several times this evening that we're working on African time, and so our 203 delegates will be streaming in uh, as the night progresses. I hope that we will not be finished by the time all of them get here. But be that as it may, I just want to welcome you this evening. And um, the program has been shuffled slightly because of uh, we've had to accommodate uh, the, the number of people here. Sorry, could I ask the catering people? Sorry. 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 Excuse me, could I ask you to be a little quieter, thank you? Thank you. I can't compete with an orchestra. Um, my name is Derek. Um, I'm with the Mzala Ngomalo Center. Uh, some of you know me and some of you don't. Um, those who know me, uh, I don't know if they like me, but they do know me. Uh, I hope to meet every delegate uh, this evening. I want to start with the formalities, um, and uh, this is how I think we should begin. Sorry. Um, sorry. Just close the door if you're going to make a noise. Um, I want to welcome, first of all, all our guest speakers uh, who've come from various parts of the world who've given up their time, some who've traveled very reluctantly against their will. Um, and so I want to welcome them. Uh, uh, Jacques de Pelchin, uh, Professor Wamba de Awamba, sorry Jacques, I left Professor off your name as well. Um, Professor Holly Lewis, Professor Tatiana Beringer from Brazil. Holly Lewis is from the United States. Uh, uh, Firoz Manji, who is from Germany currently, but also uh, lives in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and local speakers, um, Nomkusi Tulugama, I don't see her. Pat Horn uh, from StreetNet. Oh, I've forgotten our esteemed colleague from Ghana. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot you, but welcome this evening. And uh, I'd also want to welcome the members of our board uh, who are here this evening. Some have not been able to make it this evening, but to the members of the board, thank you for being here with us. And uh, I also want to welcome the Mzala Ngomalo staff who um, have been very hard at work today and uh, I think the success of their hard labor will be reaped. I particularly want to um, thank some of the invited guests who are here, Dr. Lichle Kulu, welcome this evening. Um, I, uh, Mr. Eric Appelgren from Etequeni Municipality, municipality said he might make it. I don't see him, but I'm expecting him to make it here. 
And I want to end there with all protocols observed because no one should after this have to observe any protocol. Um, uh, let's hope that doesn't turn into a riot. But welcome everyone and we hope that you, that the conference, uh, which will be taking place however big or small, um, will be fruitful and that it is being live streamed, so you can tell people who are not here that they can get it on YouTube. Unfortunately, we haven't evolved yet in South Africa to have available data everywhere. But maybe one day that will be a reality so that people everywhere would be able to have access to these kinds of events. I just also want to say that the mixture of speakers over the next three days are not, purely ac are not just academics. There are a range of speakers who are in trade unions, community-based organizations, uh, academics, of course, and people who are activists. And I think that's been the importance of having an event like this, is that we, we talk to a whole audience that is on the left. Without further ado, I want to invite the OJ Stars, which is a, a, a group of Congolese musicians uh, who are a part of our country. They live in Durban, and we've invited them to, to start the evening off. So uh, let's give a welcome to OJ Stars. Good evening, everyone. Sing in Nanzambia, Sumangai, Bonavan, 
la la Go, 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Baila, 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 baila. Go 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you. Well, if you're not alive and woken up after that, then uh, don't hold out much hope for you for the rest of the evening. <laughs> um, thank you very much, guys. That's a, a real introduction to the evening. Um, we are now going to move, I'm going to invite up the stage the CEO of the Mzala Ngomalo Center, uh, Mr. Jabulani Sitole, to say a few words of welcome to everyone. Give it up, give it up. Good evening, thanks Comrade Derek. Um, on behalf of Mzala Ngumalo Center, I would like to welcome all the delegates, welcome the speakers from different parts of the world. And uh, I must actually say we are looking forward to the next three days, especially the, the engagements and the debates uh, on socialism. I'm made to understand that the conference we are having here on Marxism in Africa is the first of its kind. Now, in 2017, if I, my memory serves me well, we held a conference in Durban on the future of the left. One of the things that uh, has been bothering some of us, thinking quite critically about what we are engaging in, was that at the end of that conference, an undertaking was actually made that we should not actually turn conferences into talk shows where we talk, and I think those who are in academia do know that we end up saying some of the ideas that were shared were just academic. Now, my, the CEO actually said earlier on, we deliberately ensured that we have a mixture of people, some being activists, some in academia, some in various sectors, with a view that uh, over the next two days, we're actually going to learn with, from one another but much more importantly, we are going to think about where we are uh, globally, where the time when your liberal sort of democracy, uh, I mean your liberal sort of system is actually very influential and is actually undermining everything. How is it that we are going to ensure that we don't actually lose sight and we stay focused and we actually centralize the interest of the working people in general and the working class in particular? So hopefully in the next few days we'll be applying those sort of ideas on, with a view of saying, how do we move from here going forward, especially trying to contest the space that uh, your, your, your capitalism has actually uh, taken and actually uh, gained hegemony in. So how do we actually move things in favor of that? Now, in those ways, I would like to actually welcome all and say on behalf of the Mzala Ngumalo Center, we will, uh, as much as possible, be available to actually assist and ensure that the lives of the delegates and those that are participating in the conference are actually made easier that we debate and you can call on, 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 on them under the leadership of Derek and myself, obviously, uh, to actually assist where possible. In those few words, I would like to actually say you are most welcome. Thank you, Comrade Jabalani. Um, 
I just want to, at this point, say something briefly about the musicians. Um, it has been my passion since I joined the center to pay attention particularly to the arts. Zala's article, The Artist as Liberator, always inspired me. And I think his critique of then, in the 80s, of artists that take their shows, who produce plays, and the message that they portray is very important. What I have come to understand in South Africa as time has gone on, that the arts remain largely ignored. People are brought to perform, but in communities and at schools, very little education is paid to art. And that's fine art, any kind of art. Uh, and the evidence in Kailicha, for instance, in Cape Town, was the production of a beautiful, taking Bizet's Carmen and turning in Carmen in Kailicha. And I think if you have a look at that, you can see the power of music, of acting, and of the arts. So this is why at every event, I make sure we have some kind of artistic display or artists performing. Tomorrow, you're going to be seeing at the back a struggle t-shirt exhibit. But it is a commitment we've made to the arts. As well as at the center, we've been buying art over the three years from local artists, artists who are not known out there, and we've bought their art, and we are hoping that one day the center becomes a place that people visit for our, the enthusiasm for our left-wing tradition, but also for our art. So that is the, the, um, the thinking behind it. I want to welcome now on stage Ilima. I don't know uh, where they are. The, the other act that was supposed to be uh, uh, didn't make it, so we're going to move on to that. Now, I'm not going to say much about this particular group, but I'm going to let uh, Bab Sitol, who is reading the group, explain. The, this is a revival of traditional music in UKZN pre-colonial era. Okay, and they are going to perform using traditional instruments and uh, variations of that over time. And I'll let, I'll let uh, 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 Bab Sitole uh, give an introduction of that. I see he's just uh, gone to the back, but we want to welcome them on stage. Ilima, thank you. gentlemen. Good evening. <laughs> uh, the first piece that I'm going to do, I want to honor the person who taught me the instrument. This is called Mbira, and the person is Dr. Mutero, and the, the, the piece is titled 
Vano Kaiwa. And seated next to me is, uh, okay, by the way, my name is Nozu Kongutu. And seated next to me, <laughs> seated next to me is Musisi Wengubane. We are going to do a piece um, which is my own composition. It's titled Ndifelani. Uh, it literally means, why am I bewitched? You know the story with Africans. It always has to do with witchcraft. So Ndifelani. Why am I being bewitched? Is it because I'm the most beautiful woman in the auditorium? <laughs> or oh, is it because I'm knowledgeable? Is it because of my artistry? Which means, oh, just give me a break. Okay, I hope you enjoy. Tu 
Ula wela nena ndingo nanga ndo Oh, 
Thank you. You, San Bonani. San Bonani. This is Africa, but for it, San Bonani. San Bonani. I've been watching them play. Now it's my turn. <laughs> so I'm so actually I'm so speechless. Guys, the outfit before you is called Ilima. Ilima in uh, in Zulu means collaboration. Are you with me, guys? So the instrument that I'm going to play now is, is, is called umkangala. This instrument was played by, by our, I will say, our forefathers during the Stone Age. So we have decided to uh, to resume where they left off. Because I think and I believe some of you have never heard of these instruments before and they have never seen these instruments before. The in this instrument is called, what is it called? Umkangal. The other one is called Udoko. Please behave yourself. This is my belly. I'm an African man. The song that I'm going to render now is entitled Umtanda Zoweche. Please enjoy. Oh, my God. 
There's something that I've noticed to some of you. <laughs> they are so scared. They, they are so intimidated, and they feel threatened just because of this sound. I know it's a very, very serious sound, but please enjoy it, guys. Don't be so serious. I can see some of you, uh, your face is full of frowns, man. Come on, man. The song that you are going to render now is entitled Amambuka, The Sell Outs. Amambuka, The Sell Outs. My, my two beautiful sisters are going to join me in this one. And unfortunately, oh, no, 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 let me just hold my horses. Sorry, I'm an African. I'm not used to this. Papela bantu nakama bugane zipamu 
Ubapela Bantu, Aulezi Pamu, Bapela Bantu, Aulezi Pamu. Sashem Suluze, Hamam Buganese Pamu, 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 Hamam Buganese
Susan! What in the singing is, 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 what in the singing 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 what in the what in the singing what in what in the singing what in the singing what in the singing Thank you very much for that, and uh, we hope there are younger people here who will be inspired to learn and take over where they might leave off one day. Um, in the interest of time, I know we started late, tummies might be rumbling, but um, I'm going to keep it flowing as quickly as possible. I'm now going to invite Comrade Jenny Schreiner our chairperson of the board at the Mzalan Ngumalo Center to say a few words. Comrade Derek, you put me between people's stomachs and their food. It's not a kind thing to have done. Good evening all, um, and I will as Derek has asked, try and keep the process flowing. Um, let me first of all say a, a very good evening to all of you, to each and every one of you, wherever you have come from. Uh, we are thoroughly inspired by the collective wisdom that we have in this hall tonight and that we're going to have in the conference over the next three days. I hope you've traveled well. I hope you're well accommodated. And most importantly, I hope that you are stimulated to be able to live up to the expectations of this, this conference. We are excited by the vibrant exchange that we anticipate. Um, in engaging with the situation that the left faces in the global situation in which imperialism is, and neoliberalism are on the rampage. Alternatively, showing their wolfish teeth, uh, Trump is not somebody who hesitates for a moment in exposing the tactics and the strategies and the actions of the imperialists. But alternating from showing that brutality and that intent to donning the sheep's clothing and under the guise of good governance, of uh, service delivery, of improving efficiency, we face the other side of the imperialist and neoliberal agendas. 
and it is up to us through a conference like this, through our work not only in these days, but as we go home back to our institutions, to our organizations, to our communities, to make sure that we engage very strongly in taking forward the, the, the debate and the, the sh information sharing that is going to happen over the next couple of days. A recent solidarity mission to Venezuela has reinforced for me the absolute centrality of the battle of ideas. And this conference and building on the tradition of Comrade Mzala is primarily around that battle of ideas. It is a battle royal against imperialist forces that are massive, well-resourced, well-organized, and globally organized around uh, ensuring that our agenda is not one that sees the light. So the Venezuelan comrades very passionately conveyed to us that we should convey to all who want to listen that their struggle is not simply a Venezuelan struggle. It is, in fact, a struggle that impacts on all of us globally. The that the lessons that they are learning from their ongoing 20-odd uh, years of fighting an imperialist attempt to regime change or have a coup d'etat is something that is not unique to Venezuela. And they cite Libya, they cite Iraq, and they point out to us that the imperialist agenda will take the same strategy with all of its complexities in any developing country that has wealth, that has the ability to form an alternative society. So as part of the South, um, both with having pulled together academics and activists from Africa as well as from Latin America, from across the globe, we need to ensure that we are ensuring a joined up process. And I'm really hoping that we are not going to land up where we share ideas over these three days and then go back to our individual spaces, but we remain solidly linked into an ongoing communication, sharing of experiences, and most importantly, taking forward that battle of ideas. And there's no point in us taking forward a battle of ideas if we are able to be the cleverest intellectuals, be able to produce the most sophisticated analysis, unless we are able to ensure that the ideas that we are going to be sharing become owned by our communities, owned by the working class, owned by the working people, and are hegemonic in society. The socialist future that we are wanting to build, that we are committed to build, and that we are building, will not materialize. So for me in particular, it's very exciting to see in this room um, academics of decades, and you can now look at the, the gray hair in the room and see the decades of academia, and the academics of emerging PhD students and masters, the students who have joined us, the activists, and I in particular want to emphasize the fact that there's no distinction between the academics in the room and the activists in the room and the organizers in the room. Because if you're a Marxist, you've got to be all three. So we, we're in a situation in which modern communication, the digital age, is putting us in a situation in which we've got enormous opportunities to take forward the battle of ideas. But at the same time, we're up against the full might of the capitalist ownership and control of precisely that medium. Um, so I want us, as we go through the, the, the days ahead of us, to reflect, how do we deal with the fact that on our phones, on our laptops, on our tablets, in our TVs, in our houses, we are bombarded by CNN, by Sky News, by The Citizen, our local version, or Independent Online, our local version, how do we ensure that there's an alternative voice that is being heard as loudly and as articulately? And again, for me, the process in Venezuela of the Telesur, the South TV program that is moving on a free-to-air basis into Africa um, is a, a, a process in which we need to be exploring what are the opportunities that that form of communication provides us and are we actually using that to our maximum? But for me, that there is that critical litmus test. 
if the ideas, our opinions, our contributions in these three days are not landing up where they're going viral, there should be something wrong. Either we're not talking to the issues that are of real concern to the working people of this country and of the developing world in the South, or we are speaking in a language and that may be in the actual language, but it may be in the form of the particular language that we're talking in, that does not resonate with the very people who we need to ensure take control of the ideas and organize behind the ideas and struggle behind the ideas. So I'm hoping that as we engage in what will be rigorous, vibrant, and dynamic debate, amongst ourselves, we are also looking at how do we ensure that we get those communication messages out so that they really are owned by the working people of, 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 our, of, our, of the globe um, and do become hegemonic in the struggle for an alternative socialist future. So for me, true to the tradition of Comrade Mzala and of this center, which is a center committed to left-wing thought and practice and thought and practice if, if I thought of um, what, would I, what would be the first things that came to my mind when somebody asked me to think about Comrade Mzala, it would be thought and practice and complete integrity. Call a spade a spade, doesn't matter who's standing in front of you. And for me, those are things that we need to draw, draw from that inspiration, that heritage, and I like the way in which we are building the heritage issues into the way in which the Imzala Center organizes its events. But let's ensure that the heritage not, is not a heritage past, but is also a heritage to the future. So we are faced with a situation in which we are dealing with the national question in an age of globalization, in which the global forces have a very serious and not always constructive impact on the issues of a national democratic revolution of the nation state. And I think that we are called on as we're meeting to look at whether we are still on track for the national democratic revolution as a building block towards a socialist future. Do we all share the same understanding of what a national democratic revolution is? Or have we landed up in a situation in which primitive accumulation strategies, primarily through the state, have actually taken over our commitment to a national democratic revolution and turned it into something else. We're in a situation in which there's a global crisis around social reproduction. As capital faces its crises, social reproduction is one of the areas in which cutbacks take place and the increased burden on the working class to carry that burden of social reproduction takes place. As people who are functioning in countries in which we are building a democratic state, a developmental state, a progressive state, a state of a different form, how do we ensure that we look at the social reproduction crisis differently in a way that actually empowers community, in a way that builds organization, and in a way that actually enables the state to have a profoundly different relationship with the people of the country. So we will talk about social reproduction as we go through this program, and we will look at the services that are needed, needed to ensure that there is humane social reproduction as opposed to the capitalist reproduction of ensuring that at the least possible cost, people are able to go to work the next day in order to create the capitalist profits. And this inherently asks us to look at the question, the story of gender. But I do want to say that we need to ensure also that we don't reduce the story of gender to the issue of social reproduction. Far too often we land up where we either say, get women into the economy and we've solved the problem. No, uh -uh, we don't. Or get women into social reproduction and, and social services and we solve the problem, and we don't. So I want to ask all of the chair people and the presenters as we go through this conference to ask yourselves and to pose the question to the, the, the audiences that we in, engage with. What are the implications of what you are saying and what you are doing for the dismantling of patriarchy, for the social emancipation and economic empowerment 
of black working class women, of black rural women, of women within the working people of each of our countries. And as Maxine Molyneux said to us as long ago as 1977, and I'm now showing my age, um, but for me, one of the most profound statements um, that gender-blind analysis is profoundly unrigorous, and one of the issues that we take from Imzala's uh, legacy that he has given us is at all times be rigorous. So gender-blind is unrigorous, and it is also completely unmarxist. So let's ensure that as we go through this process, we, we take that as, as, a, as a challenge for us to be able to look at. We need to be conscious of how imperialism is threatened by societies that have an alternative approach to social reproduction, and we need to build on that. Um, as we engage, we have people from a range of different countries, and we need to ensure that we explore how is social reproduction being addressed in all of those countries, and what are the lessons that we can, can, can learn? What do we expect state delivery to be in relation to social reproduction? How do we use the wealth of our countries for social reproduction, for the addressing of social needs of people, as opposed to addressing the, the profit motivation of, of the capitalists? But what we do need to understand is that as we engage with that, capitalism, is going to resist. Capitalism will not take alternative societies and alternative models lying down. And it's up to us to ensure that we're able to step up to the plate. And that perhaps then gets us to the state of the state. Now, in South Africa at the moment, the state of the state is probably one of the most painful issues that we can, can address. But I don't think that our experiences are unique. Um, they may not be as in your face as the state capture has been and is currently in South Africa, but we can look across the developing world and see that the issues of the state are things that we need to pay very serious attention to. What form of state do we need to build a socialist future? Given the role that the state has played in our colonial past in underdeveloping our countries. Is it enough for us to deracialize? And I'm not sure that this is an English word, but it's now a word. Demasculinizing the state. Is that enough for us to have a state that will build a socialist future? What is the form of the interaction that we're expecting as Marxists for a state to have with the community, with the working people? How does the state create space for working people to build an alternative future? Or are we expecting a state to be the clever people sitting in the state who decide on behalf of the working people, this is the model that we're going to impact on? Now, I can see already that there are heads shaking around a state down and ensuring that we want to be able to build the bottom up. Clearly it has to be elements of both because we need to ensure that the resources of the state enable that bottom up. But I think that that's one of the key issues that we need to be able to attend to. When we're talking about addressing the national question, we're talking about addressing the woman question, when we're talking about capital and labor, the issue of the state and whether the state is properly geared in our countries for playing the role that it should be playing is one of the key elements that we need to move forward. We are, we are in the midst of a digital revolution, a digital revolution that has changed the communication environment that we're in, potential and enormous risks, obviously, given the, the capital control of that. But it's also very importantly changing the face of capitalism and the face of labor. And that's another of the issues that we will be focusing on as we go through the next couple of days. Looking at how does that, combined with the crisis of social reproduction, the levels of unemployment, the issues of retrenchment, um, how does that change the face of labor? And what does that do in terms of posing a real question to us of what are the alternatives? What forms of organization outside of the conventional capitalist economy should we be exploring? And we will be able to engage with a, a number of, of contributions in relation to that, that look at 
how do we ensure that there is a solidarity economy, a social co economy, a cooperative economy, a commune base? What are the models that we want to be able to take forward? What can we learn from the various different countries? Now, I'm sure that I don't need to tell a conference of Marxist academics and activists that Marx admonished us that the purpose of understanding the world was not an end in itself, but it was to change it. And that, for me, is one of the most critical elements when we get to the point of discussing on the ground, because this really does enable us to get to a point of understanding to what extent is what we are engaging with as intellectuals, as strategists, as theoreticians, as leaders within our organizations, actually being reflected in the reality of how people are living. What is the lived experience, and how do we want that lived experience of the working people of our countries, urban and rural, to be able to change? The future is not something that is created in conferences or in boardrooms. The future is something that is one on the ground. It is one in struggle and is one in organization. And the value that we have as a conference, um, Marxism Africa 2019, is only valued by the extent to which we can take that into struggle and into our organizations. So I'm hoping that as we go through the next couple of days, we will be able to lift up in the conference publication that will come out of it. Social innovation, different forms of organization, different strategies that need to be put in place to shape our future society in all of our countries. Imperialism is a global force. We try to deal with building a socialist future in isolation in individual countries. We are going to land up not getting very far. Comrades and friends, our conference sessions can only touch on the challenges that Marxists face in addressing class, ethnicity, race, gender, patriarchy, the national question, and finding a way to build the path to socialism in South Africa and in Africa and in the South. The Mzala Center is very proud to be able to host you in Durban in this year. We are striving to maintain the Mzala Center. We are striving to be able to ensure that this time next year, we are again meeting, um, that we are able to build on what we have taken forward. But we are also hoping that in between our conferences, we do not land up in isolation. We are networking here, we are forming connections, we are cutting across generations, we're cutting across organizations, we're cutting across continents. And we have the technology, we have the means, we have the willpower to be able to ensure that the, di the dialogue, the debate, and the sharing of experiences, and the sharing in particular of how we organize is something that can take forward in between times. So we are hoping that true to the, and in the interests of Marxist thought and in the tradition of Comrade Mzala, who was a committed theorist, a writer and an activist of the ANC and the SACP, a strategist, and I want to emphasize the word strategist. This was not somebody who wrote intellectually, analyzed, wrote theory, enabled us to better understand, but this is somebody who also took that theory and was tossed by the ANC, by the party, by MK, to go and put those strategies into place. But most importantly, as I'm concluding, Comrade Mzala's intellectual rigor and his readiness to speak truth to power, to be able to say what needed to be said to whoever needed to hear it, is what we did. Not only to be here, but to prepare inputs that, quite frankly, I am really inspired just by looking at the content, let alone having heard what the contributions are going to be. And I do think that we're at a point at which we have got enormous potential in this collective wisdom and collective activism in this conference to be able to make a serious difference. And that is the commitment that the board would like to make to you 
that in partnership with you, let's really go ahead and make a difference. I thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I have to... Um, uh, Minister Bladen Zamandi has sent his apologies and uh, won't be able to be here, but um, wishes us well for the conference. Before we go to our keynote uh, speaker, I'm going to invite uh, the Zamani Happy Boys, who are going to present to us another form of music which is uh, particular to KZN and which has a huge following both here and in the rest of the country. I want you to give a round of applause, applause to them. Thank you, Jim. Niapila. Hey. Zobega na timu tu jembili. Eh, wabase kutume gana git. Kwa kisha jengo maya marpino zimu. Kuza nje, unga bula wako awo. Marpino zimu. Ine miye group, kukui zaman happy boys. Ivela kwa mashu. Eh, umpatuwa yoke, usabelo ngumaz. Zobonga nje. Thank <laughs> you. 
the shout in 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 the And now what we've been waiting for, um, 
I'm not going to say much. I'm going to ask uh, Richard Pitaus to come up to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, and then we will hear from wisdom itself. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, you know, when people are asked to do this, they always say it's a great honor, but that's just a formality. But in this case, it actually is a, a great honor to be asked to introduce Jacques. He's had an extraordinary life. The trajectory of his life has moved through all kinds of moments in the history of our continent where um, the floodlights of history have shone with tremendous intensity. He's, he's been in, well, he's from the Congo, as a child, um, in the time of Lumumba, colonialism. Uh, as an academic, he was in Dar es Salaam when the university there was the absolute focal point of intellectual, radical intellectual life in the continent, attracting people from all over the world, people like Walter Rodney, people from the Caribbean, uh, he was in Mozambique. Um, in fact, he was there when Ruth first was murdered. He was there that day in the office. Um, he's taught in the United States. He currently teaches in Brazil. He's multilingual. I don't know how many languages he speaks. I know he speaks English and French and Portuguese and Kiswahili. I've heard him quote a very notorious statement by... Um, Mobutu in Lingala, um, a man of the world for sure, but an intellectual who's always remained committed to where he came from. Um, he's a historian, written a famous book on the Congo, he's written books that reflect critically on how African history is understood, and he's one of those people who've been able to sustain their creativity, their, their drive, to understand the world um, throughout their lives. Many people, if they achieve something, they, that's their gig, that's what they do. Jacques, um, working with people like the great Ghanaian novelist, Ayikwa Ma, has learned hieroglyphics, and he's been involved in a project to translate ancient, ancient African texts into multiple languages, English, French, but also Isizulu, which I think is an extraordinary thing. We, this is a, a center that's committed to Marxist thought, to radical thought. It's often the case that radicals who spend enough time in or around universities sometimes start to substitute lots of jargon for actual human relations and actual thinking about praxis. Jacques is a deeply humane person who engages people with a real sense of their dignity as human beings, a man who, without any kind of public performance, has for years been in touch with grassroots activists in this city, um, constant communication, always thoughtful, never cliched, always trying to reach to the human content of the situation that people find themselves in. And it's not just Durban. I know he has similar engagements in other parts of the world, like in, like in Haiti. Um, Jacques. I'm sure you can do better. Um, good evening, Habari, ah, yeah. um, well, um, you know, all of these previous acts, the music, are extremely 
difficult, if not impossible, to follow. So if you fall asleep, I won't blame you, but I'll try my best to respond to the expectation. Uh, Richard has exaggerated. Uh, you know, whoever is an individual, and, you know, you, you don't get there just on your own strength. I don't want to spend too much time, but I wouldn't have gotten where I did get if it were not for, among other many people, but my parents. I don't want to spend too much time on the story myself, but I was born in a rural area, not in a hospital, from a white father, Robert de Pelchin, and a black mother, Suzanne Nyabinshi de Pelchin. She, not schooled, he schooled, but never managed to actually go to college. Came to the Congo in 33 to work for the colonial state, did not like it, resigned, but decided that he had to stay in the Congo. So, all the things that I learned, especially with regard to knowledge, knowledge is not just simply what you learn at school or in universities. Back home, around the table, the language was Kiswahili and French because my mother, even though she understood French, she did not speak French because she just preferred to continue speaking Kiswahili, Kinyarwanda, Kirundi, or Kifuriru. So, and of course, I would not be here if it were not for things that I learned from my friend, my brother, Ernest Wamba Diawamba. I owe him more than I can even begin to put together. What I'm trying to say is that in a, this kind of dominant system, which really pushes for individualism, in fact, hyper-individualism, which in fact is, of course, you know, even uh, pushed to the limits with these, what I call, infernal machines, the cellular phones, or stupidifying machines, that I call them. They bring people closer, and yet people are unable to really develop new practices of solidarity, of working together. So the other person that, the, the, the list is very long. I don't want to spend my time just listing, but the other person I owe a lot to is my life companion, Pauline Winter. We met in 66, we married in 68, we had two children, Kaidi and Chadi, and uh, yes, we have, uh, we have one grandchild, and, but she is the first reader of anything I write, of discussion, so she's the person who criticizes, she's from Antigua, and we met in London, for those who want to know the details. Um, I made the mistake be doing sort of cheap talk when I first met her, asking her, are you from Nigeria? And of course, she never forgot, for, forgave me. She, she, she was from Antigua, and um, yes, and we're still there, we're still together. Anyway, then of course, as Richard said, yes, uh, it, it, by, from 211, Aikwarma, the Ghanaian, he calls himself an African writer, an African artist, because the way he writes, in fact, yes. The way he writes, yes, he's an artist. Writing is an art. History is an art. It's not a science. Uh, one of the quarrels I have is that if you look at capitalism, the central, the central concept is a mode of production, when in fact it should really be the mode of existence. 
and not emphasizing economy above all. So um, this is a very hard act to follow because uh, before I do anything, I would like to just simply donate these three books, which are the product of this hieroglyphic group, to the library of the center. So I just want to go. Um, the, the, you're welcome. The, the, the thing is that these texts do exist. You can even find them online. But what we, what Aiku Arma, who's the organizer of this, uh, has said, but look, let's produce these texts, transliterate from ancient Egyptian, translate in other languages, African languages. People forget that Sheikh Anta Diop actually translated in Wolof Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, the, the, in the documentary that we shall see, I think, um, in a, in a, after tomorrow, you'll see this is not fabrication. Sheikh Anta was trying to just simply say against the colonizers that this notion that African languages cannot be used to translate science is just simply a lie. And so he translated the theory of relativity by Einstein in Wolof, among other things. Now, I've written, I've written a paper. It's very long. I'm not going to read from the paper. It's not my habit. But because of what I sense as an injustice to Sheikh Anta Diop, I'm going to have to read what he actually had to say on certain crucial issues, simply because he says it much better than I could ever think of actually saying this, All right? So I, 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 will, I will ask for your patience, but I'll try to be as brief as possible so that I presume there are going to be questions, or maybe not, I don't know, all right? Um, so the subtitle, you know, Global Economic Imperialism and the Politics of Underdevelopment, the subtitle I gave is Capitalism and the Destruction of Human Consciousness slash Consciousnesses, plural. So um, the preamble, the context in which this paper has been written is, among other things, the climate crisis, the climate change. And as it has been pointed out, changes does not take, changes, change does not take place unless you really enter. And it's very interesting to observe world over how the younger generation have decided to tackle the climate crisis. Because they, the young ones, 15, 14, 15, 16 year old in high school, they are the ones who are going to really suffer most the result of climatic changes. And so they are now organizing strikes to show that no, what you adults have decided to do is insufficient. And they are doing it, and I'm sure the creativity is really going to be at work there. So, the, I'm going to just simply highlight a few points. When it comes to capitalism, there are two types of capitalism historically. There is a capitalism that emerged out of Europe historically, and then there is a capitalism that was built outside of Europe. When Europeans leave Europe, they go to the Americas. And what do they do? They slaughter on their way to the Americas. The first encounter with the Europeans and the Indians is genocide. After genocide, we have industrialized enslavement. It is still capitalism. After industrialized enslavement, we have colonization. Colonization, apartheid, and now neoliberalism, which is really a euphemism for something which is much, much worse because it's a cumulative, the cumulative process of what happened with the genocide 
industrialized enslavement, colonization, and apartheid. Now, when you look at that record, shouldn't you ask the question, could it be that from the very beginning, capitalism outside of Europe, was it not, and maybe even also in Europe, was it not a crime against humanity? Some time ago, I was invited to a conference, and I put the title, could it be that capitalism is a crime against humanity? The organizers were being funded by, obviously, a group that would not look well on the title of the paper. They, they just freaked out and said, no, you can't use that title. So I removed the title, but I didn't change the content. Anyway, um, so with regard to Sheikh Anta Diop, Sheikh Anta Diop, this is an interesting thing. Sheikh Anta Diop was a Marxist through and through. And if you go online, you can actually read the translation of, well, it's in English, civilization or barbarism for an, an authentic anthropology. Sheikh Anta Diop was Senegalese, born in Senegal. At the end of World War II, he's given a scholarship to go and study aeronautical engineering in Paris. He goes to Paris, he circulates in the university in Sorbonne, and he comes upon somebody who's actually teaching a lesson in hieroglyphs. And he immediately sees a connection between the hieroglyphs and his own language, Wolof. And so he changes, he says, no, I'm not going to study aeronautical engineering because he's excellent in, in math, in sciences. He says, no, I don't want to study that, I want to study Egyptology. And so by doing that change and studying anthropology, uh, all the social sciences, including nuclear chemistry, nuclear physics, linguistics, in other words, the sciences I would call silencing sciences, but without silencing his own consciousness. That is Sheikh Anta Diop at work. By 1954, he's ready to defend his thesis, but um, it's impossible to actually put together an examination board. So what he had studied, what he had worked on, comes out as a book. And that's the first book that um, was published in 1954. So this is what you read from, and I beg you to forgive me, um, but it's better to hear what he actually had to say. The new Egyptology, so he's talking about how Egyptology started and how one of the scient scientists who was sent by Napoleon to Egypt, Volney, comes to Egypt and looks around the monuments and says, but wait a second, these things here, the Sphinx, etc., these things look African. Could it be that we have enslaved the people who actually have really done all these great things? But that's an exception, Volney. So then, uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, and I, I'm reading, he says, the new Egyptological ideology born at the opportune moment forced the theoretical basis of imperialistic ideology. That is why it easily drowned the voice of science by throwing the veil of justification over historical truth. This ideology, this is a, taken from the beginning of civilization or barbarism. This ideology was spread with the help of considerable publicity and taught the world over because it alone had the material and financial means for its own propagation. Thus, imperialism, like the prehistoric pre hunter, first killed the being spiritually and culturally before trying to eliminate it physically. The negation of the history and intellectual accomplishments of black Africans was cultural, mental murder, which preceded and paved the way for the genocide here and there in the world. So this is the beginning of the preface of civilization or uh, barbarism. He continues, and this is from another, uh, another book, um, 
the African origin of civilization, myth of reality. The African historian who evades the problem of Egypt is neither modest nor objective nor unruffled. He is ignorant, cowardly, and neurotic. Imagine, if you can, the uncomfortable position of a Western historian who was to write the history of Europe without referring to Greco Latin antiquity and try to pass that off as a scientific approach. And to make sure there is no misunderstanding, Shekanta added, the ancient Egyptians were Negroes. The moral fruit of their civilization is to be counted among the assets of the black world. Instead of presenting itself to history as an insolvent debtor, that black world is the very initiator of the quote unquote Western civilization flaunted before our eyes today. Pythagorean mathematics, the theory of the four elements of Thales of Miletus, Epicurean materialism, Platonic idealism, Judaism, Islam, and modern science are rooted in Egyptian cosmogony and science. And it, it, it's so obvious, if you, if you, even if you don't read hieroglyphs, you just go and read the text. And you find myths that show that, in fact, things started way before. These Greek writers, Aristotle, Socrates, all recognize, acknowledge that they learned everything from ancient Egypt. And he continues, one needs only to meditate on Osiris, the redeemer who sacrifices himself, dies, and is resurrected to save mankind, a figure essentially identifiable with Christ. So he died in 1986. He was born in 1923. So one of the reasons I'm still in Brazil, even though I'm retired, is to try to see if through translations, some, the centenary of Sheikh Anta Diop could actually be commemorated with some sort of dignity and not just simply pretend that, well, you don't know, um, all, all kinds of excuses, really. Um, so that, that's, that's going to be in 223, hoping that by then I will still be alive. But, you know, it doesn't really matter because there are others who are going to be continuing it. Now, the current context we're dominated by the climatic crisis is really brought all the antagonism at the surface. Um, Deep-seated antagonisms, uh, people are, you know, based, are, are, are you know, hyper-individualistic and hierarchizing practices promoted by capitalism are going to encourage humans to maintain that because the idea is that, well, I'm better than you. Um, and, and that is really rooted. I mean, you, 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 you see it all the time. It seems to me, and this is one of the things that I would like to actually argue for, and, and that's what is really the gist of, I mean, the central uh, objective of Aiko Arma's last book, The Way of Companions. He called it The Way of Companions. I call it a commune, a knowledge commune. In other words, everyone on this planet knows something. And if you go and look at, you know, for example, uh, you know, the, the people before these climate science scientists, there are people who actually noticed that things were wrong way back in 1991. For example, scientists you know, in, in, at the University of Nairobi had pointed out that there was something wrong in the climate. Um, Thomas, Goro, Thomas Goro from uh, Jamaica, the whole family actually, generation after generation, had shown how the, the, the coral reefs were bleaching as a result of climate change. But nobody paid attention. Because if you belong to anything Africa, well, you know, what do you know? After all, you know, Hegel said, well, you know, out of Africa, it's only darkness. And however hard it is to say, when it comes to Africa, there is no difference between Marx and Hegel. By that, I mean that Marx 
obviously might have disagreed, but with regard to Africa, they really thought the same way. There's nothing that really came out of Africa because class struggle only began when they are beginning to have classes. Now, interestingly, if you go into ancient Egypt, you have classes in Pharaonic Egypt. But those, th that history is just simply relegated as if it doesn't exist. I studied African history, and we were told then that the only way, no, African history, we don't have archives. We don't have written archives. Jan van Sina would write these, these, these methodological books about oral history and telling us that, well, there are no written archives. What about ancient Egypt? So deliberately, it was simply put aside, and, 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 and people said, well, and you went along, because you go to do a PhD, and you want to make sure that you get a job. So you're not going to go against the grain, right? When I finished the PhD in 74, I knew about Sheikh Anta Diop's work. But you also learned how to say that, yes, Sheikh Anta Diop is right, but you know, there are problems. Now, is there any field of knowledge where there are no problems? So, um, the, the true nature of capitalism, my, my sense is this, the true nature of capitalism, we really still do not get it. It seems to me that in, with regard to Africa, for example, the, the, the educational system still has to be decolonized. But if you say that, well, we are independent, then, well, you know, but in South Africa, it's not just to point out that it's only South Africa, because the same problem occurs in Senegal, where Sheikh Anta Diop was born. The, colonial, the, the educational system is still fundamentally colonial. Instead of saying, our knowledge be, the knowledge of our history began way, way, way back, before ancient Greece, ancient Rome. People will say that, and yet nothing is being done so that the whole system could be transformed. Here, you know, road statues were demolished, but then what do we do? Right? Uh, my friend and hieroglyphic teacher, Yoporeka Somet, whom we call Yopo, he has two PhDs, one in philosophy, one in African Egyptology, and he is in France, but not really working as what he should be working for. Now, why is it not possible that, for example, a country like South Africa could harness the resources and say, Yopo, come here, here is, you know, stay with us for one semester, two semesters, two years, so that you can show us how we can actually begin to really root ourselves in our history, which is much longer than what we've always been told about, right? Um, now, I'm not trying to uh, teach lessons here, even if I sound like I'm, <laughs> I'm doing so. No, that's not, that's not so. But I, I find it hard that somebody with two PhDs is not working where he should be working. Anyway, let's keep going. Um, so, ah, this is another thing about uh, Sheikh Anta Diop. Because people, people say, oh yeah, I know about Sheikh Anta Diop. And then what they do, and th this is really pushing the, di the, the intellectual dishonesty to extreme. They will transform his, his writings and then criticize it. Okay? Now, one of the things that Sheikh Anta Diop did, he actually used Marxism to understand all these various stages of, of history. So, um, and with regard to the different states that emerged, this is what he wrote with regard to what he described as Spartan and Tutsi type states. If for whatever reason the conquering ethnic group refuses to miss with the indigenous conquered element and bases its domination on this absolute separation. The opposition is essentially ethnic 
and will always be resolved in ancient and modern history by genocide. He continues, consequently, most of the present states of the modern world belong to the model of the state founded on genocide. It is not the exception, but rather the general rule which today encompasses three quarters of all dry land, including virtually all of Antarctica. So, interestingly, and you'll see it in the documentary, the young people in Senegal were criticizing Sheikh Anta for not being a Marxist, even though he understood Marxist inside out and criticized it. So, um, you know, one of the things he pointed out, for example, um, is that, okay, all the stages that Marx talks about with regard to the phases of history, yes, they can be found in Europe, but then they cannot be found everywhere in the world. In fact, everywhere else in the world, what happened is that the, the, the contact with Marxism was basically the contact between Europe and the conquered countries, and with what followed, you know, genocide, industrialized enslavement, etc. Now, I just want to mention a few things here that are connected to the kind of situation that we are facing. Um, so, I've, I've mentioned the capitalism perceived and understood as a crime against humanity. With regard to colonization, in particular from you know, the 20th century, if you look at World War I, World War II, and how World War II in particular ended with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, there is an interesting phenomenon there. The scholar who is picked out as the one who really understood Nazi Germany, the concentration camps, is Hannah Arendt, right? Yet, Hannah Arendt, student of Heidegger, was also married to somebody, also a student of Heidegger, Gunther Anders. Now, Gunther Anders, they were married briefly in Paris for a few years in the 30s, and then they separated. Gunther Anders went on in the United States and actually got struck by what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it led him to invent this concept the invisibility of evil. In other words, his argument was that what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was much worse than what happened in the concentration camps in Germany. And, and then he quotes, you know, Primo Levi, Primo Levi who says, who describes, you know, the Jews arriving at, at, at Auschwitz or Bickenau and even though they know they are actually getting there and are going to be, you know, killed, etc., they still do not believe that what is unbelievable is going to happen. And that's what um, Gunther Anders refers to as the invisibility of evil, except that with him, it, it's, it's manifested with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But from the, from the view of African history, we could say that, in fact, the invisibility of evil was concocted the moment Europe started conquering the rest of the world. In other words, if you read the histories of enslavement, you don't get those histories of how people were taken from, kidnapped from the villages, how they were dragged to the slave ships, what happened on the slave ships, and so on. In other words, you don't have the history of how the Jews went in those trains and went to the concentration camps. Because that part is missing, so the idea is that, well, there's no such suffering. And yet, if you begin to imagine what really happened, it is difficult to imagine the level of suffering of destruction. Which is why, and I think I want to end the to end there, because I've already spoken too much. I want to end up on, on the, the issue of reparations. There are other things I'm jumping over, 
may come up in the questions, discussions. If you say that reparations is the way, you are arguing, you are accepting the notion that it is possible to calculate what happened. My argument is that you might be able to calculate parts of it, but if you really take the whole thing, it's just simply going to be impossible to calculate. Ah, but so what do you do then? Ah, but you know, Israel got reparations. So where Israel today is with regard to Gaza and company? So it seems to me the logical thing to do and if we accept that capitalism is a crime against humanity, then the idea to do is to distance oneself radically from that system. Ah, you're a communist. Uh, of course, the ideology of what a communist is is deeply set, right? Uh, depicted as somebody with a knife in their teeth, ready to kill your children, etc. So my response is that, look, I consider myself a communist, but I've never belonged to a communist party, and I shall never belong to a communist party. Because in this kind of situation today, if you, if you enter, well, you enter into something which is already organized and prepared for you to enter. In other words, the idea that if politics is thinking, then you're not thinking if you enter there. So that's why I'm saying this. I mean, it sounds like a clever way. It sounds like a clever way of getting out of a fix. But um, so the answer to me is that, yes, a knowledge commune. Uma comuna dos saberes. Aikwarma, for example, doesn't like the idea of the commune. So he says, the way of companions. I'm fine with that too. Because the way he writes it, and I'm going to read from the back cover for those of you who um, might be interested. It's his, la his, it's his latest, last, last book, sorry. So the text, and it's, it's written by him. Of Africa's oldest way, ways of life and death, there are two. One, the royal road, irresistibly attractive to power addicts, is lined with hierarchies, priests, armies, and bureaucracies. It gave Plato his liberal model of the slave-owning aristocracy, the temp template for imperial, colonial, and apartheid systems of social inequality. The way of companions is more ancient, but it's been so long suppressed, it sounds novel. It values knowledge above power. On that intelligent way, no one is born superior, non inferior. It needs neither violence, nor fraud, no person, gender, race, or tribe is discriminated against. It creates no unemployment no homeless migrants, no refugees, no millionaires or billionaires or destitutes, only equal humans. The way of companions follows the rational measure, measure of Jehuti, the balanced justice of the Ma'at sisters, and the loving solidarity of Azar. The ancient way of companions is the way of the Beautiful Ones. And of course, he's referring here to his very first book, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. And he still believes, Aikwarma, that the beautiful ones, with a grammatical mistake in the word beautiful, because he claims that he saw that line on a bus in Accra. And he continues to say, the beautiful ones are not yet born. I always argue that, in fact, some of them have been born, but we haven't seen them yet. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Jacques. Um, Richard, uh, uh, would you like to chair the Q&A? Um, I think in the interest of time, we will limit um, what, what we have anticipated um, at, at short notice. Uh, one or two of our speakers have pulled out, so we are thinking of having another engagement. <laughs> Uh, with with your talk in a, in a, in a forum as opposed to there. So uh, we'll just take uh, one or two questions now. I wonder if I could have another roving mic, uh, if that's possible. Thanks. Okay, so we do have the roving mic, so if you could just indicate if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, Derek has it on that side. For Rose. My name is Feroz, and Jacques, thank you very much for a as always, an excellent presentation. I, I just want to take up this issue of reparations, which I think you are absolutely right about. That, um, but we have to formulate it in another way. Uh, in French, reparation is repair. And, and I think what we have to do is to seize the idea that the destruction the dehumanization of vast sections of, the, of humanity requires repair. It's not a monetary issue. It's not something that we beg of capital, as you quite rightly point out. What we have to do is to have a collective responsibility as people to find ways of repairing that, of re-establishing reinventing even our humanity, because that is a collective responsibility, not one that we beg of capital. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, This is an argument that can go on for quite a bit. I think that um, my worry is the following. The system is so dominant that it has even, well, I mean, okay. Recently, just a few days ago, in fact, the, the US Secretary of State has threatened the judges of the ICC in The Hague of not giving them visa to visit the US in case they continue to investigate crimes of war, crimes against humanity, against American soldiers in all of these wars, Iraq, Afghanistan. And he continued, he said, if, and if, they don't, if this doesn't stop them, then we are going to think about economic sanctions against these judges who are pursuing, continuing this investigation against uh, American soldiers. The argument being that the US is not a signatory to the convention, that is the argument. And uh, there are other countries. But that also indicates, you, you are quite right, the level of dehumanization is, is it very difficult to actually establish? Because wh wh how do we do that? And if, if it, and you're right, how does one rehumanize without knowing the level of dehumanization, the level of destruction? I think that, you know, if you look at, if you look at resistance, for example, people have resisted. In the black code, you know, Le Code Noir of uh, Louis XIV, 1685, torture of slaves was forbidden. In case it happened, the slave owner 
could actually be taken to justice and possibly even executed. So in that, in that code, the work of Louis Alamolin shows that one, one of the slave owners in Santo Domingo before it became Haiti actually tortured slaves because allegedly uh, they, they, they had, some s s slaves had been killed and he decided to figure out who were the slaves, who killed the slaves. And so he tortured slaves and the, the torture is actually described. Nothing happened to the slave owner. And it, to this day, fast forward, look at how the US treats you know, the Convention Against Torture. I mean, in, in Brazil, you know, the current president has argued that in fact, you know, torture did not go far enough during the dictatorship, you know, between 64 and 80, 80, 88. So, and, and this takes us back to the idea of the invisibility of evil. In other words, the, the, the power of capitalism has gone so far that it has obliterated any sense of kind of understanding what it means to be a human. I mean, you know, we all heard Mukwege's uh, speech at, at, you know, receiving the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize for, uh, yeah, Nobel Peace Prize, right? Now, you listen to what he had to say, the way he described, the way women were raped, tortured, etc., and you, you, you really ask yourself, what, how come that humans have gotten to this point? In other words, any amount of power grabbed with impunity allows you to do literally anything. And of course, now we have a technology that can go literally out of control. I mean, that's, that, that, that's you know, the, the point at which humans have reached is so uncontrollable. I, I remember years ago, I began to ask myself, is it really a good thing to talk about empowerment when in fact power is so toxic that it leads, it leads to destruction? Anybody who has a little bit of power, I mean, men think that they can just simply rape at will. On which basis? So, um, where is Feroz? Yeah, you are there. So, <laughs> Feroz, I think the, the question, I'm not trying to say that I have the answer, but it seems to me, if you think of, if you think of rape, especially the kind of rape that, you know, somebody like Mukwege had to face, you know, where you see that deliberately women are raped and then their, 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 their sexual organ are demolished purposely. But then you ask the question, what is the meaning of Nobel Peace Prizes when the person who is the most powerful president of the most powerful country received that prize and is unable, when he goes to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to apologize because apologizing for what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is, would be a sign of weakness. That is the interpretation of what power is. In other words, I think earlier on we, met, we talked about the state, but the state I mean, there, there, it's a complica complicated thing, and, and <laughs> I mean, you, you, it's not a question of grabbing the state and then turning the state around. I mean, the state is a seat of power, and as a seat of power, in fact, it, one should not enter it. It has to be transformed from outside. How? I don't know, but it's possible, in fact, now. It's in the air. It's in the air in the sense that people are willing to just say, look, that is not right. That's why the book that we transliterated and translated, the, the, the Eloquent Peasant, you know, a, a, an ancient Egyptian history 4,000 years ago. It's about a peasant who gets, you know, he's robbed on the way to the market by corrupt state officials, and then he tries to get justice. He understands what justice is about. And the, the, he keeps running, he keeps running you know, into state functionaries which, who are really completely corrupt. 
So much so, eventually, there is a state official who is so impressed by his understanding of maat, justice, solidarity, that he goes to the pharaoh and says, look, you have to listen to this peasant really making the case. It's absolutely incredible. In other words, he takes the peasant for the pleasure of the pharaoh so he can enjoy the pharaoh to hear a peasant talking about justice. But the peasant, what he can see is that justice is still not being done. So when he fa face to face with the pharaoh, I mean, this is a business of speaking truth to power. This peasant, which you can have in any country today in Africa, faces the pharaoh and began to hit hard at him and say, you are just as bad as those corrupt officials. And then eventually, but the pharaoh is so pleased. So all his goods are given back to him, and he, he gets presents and so on and so forth. But that story could become a play everywhere on this continent to just simply transform the relationship between those who claim to know the state, the power of the state, and those who are claimed to be knowing nothing. See, I mean, did I learn more from my mother who didn't go to school, or did I learn more from my father? You know, when you reflect on it, the best example I can give is when my father decides. There are about five of us at that time. We eventually got seven, but we are now five because two have departed. But he says we're going to have a savings account for all the children. So he suggests a thing to my mother. And my mother asks, well, how does it work? And then my father explained. My mother said, no, I'll stick to my cattle. Of course, she comes from a society that really is structured around cattle. So what does my father do? OK, we are going to have cattle for each of the children. So in other words, knowledge is not something that is measured only in the educational system. The educational system functions for those who hold power in the state, seems to me. I mean, how do I treat anybody, anybody, as an equal? Well, it takes practice. I mean, in Salvador, I, I go in the streets, I try to engage anybody, you know, vendor of coconut water, and it takes, you know, you, 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 it takes some sort of practice, of course. I'm not claiming to be, you know. But yes, to go down to that level, I mean, the educational system in Brazil is horrendous. Why can't professors who, you know, after three years cannot go back to the, you know, middle schools and then, you know, encounter, they try to improve the system? I have colleagues in Brazil who, who think that way, try to do it that way. Um, anyway, so that's too long as a response, but anyway, sorry about that. Okay, so I had a, a, a question as well, maybe a comment, uh, uh, just echoing what the gentleman behind me said uh, when it comes to reparations. And I was reminded of a quote from Steve Biko, who says that one of the powerful tools that the oppressor has over the oppressed is the mind. And I think that one of the issues that we have in all the countries that have faced colonization is that post-colonization, there's nobody that really deals with the mind. And the mindset, once colonized, unless decolonized uh, uh, through different transdisciplinary ways, uh, uh, when I'm bringing it into research, um, it remains in that state. And then we can find what Ellen Payton says when he says, um, the oppressed goes and oppresses the, the, the next generation, if I may call it that way. But he says that uh, unless you deal with the mind of the person who's been oppressed, 
when he receives freedom, he will go and, 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 and repeat the same thing that happened to him to the next person. Now, scientifically or medically, we call it epigenetics, which means if, 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 if I have been stressed or abused, the abuse will be engraved in my mind and it's going to change my genes and I'm going to pass that on to the next generation. So whether I receive freedom politically and even freedom economically, unfortunately, the sins of the father will continue unless we deal with the mind. So I think that one of the most important things for reparation, it is to, 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 to have a combined sort of approach which will deal with the mind, deal with the economy, deal with, with, with all the facets that dehumanized us in the first place. Okay, Wamba's going to say something and then we'll have to leave it there. Just, uh, <clears throat> I, I want to make a hypothesis so we can redefine the problem. <clears throat> My hypothesis is this. Unless both sides, oppressors and oppressed, undergo <clears throat> what I call a double break, break from the break. <clears throat> the oppressed must break from what he has been told he is, which he is not. Uh, which means rerouting himself from his own very past remote history. <clears throat> the oppressor must break <clears throat> from his imperial mentality he developed from slavery. Unless this double break takes place, we have no chance of humanizing humanity. So, so, so this is the hypothesis. So through that hypothesis, the issue is, what is the duty of the oppressed to pressurize the oppressor so that he can undergo the break from the break. <clears throat> and that's where uh, this issue of healing and reparation comes in. Anyway, just a hypothesis. You think of it. Um, well, first of all, it seems to me that we are practicing <laughs> the way of companions in the sense that You've put the question and you've answered your own question in both cases, uh, and I agree. And um, how does one put that into practice? Because, you see, if you're in academia, for example, you know, pe professor so-and-so, and I, 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 I tell people, my name is Jacques. I'm not Professor Jacques and what so on. And it's hard for people to move away from that. Um, oh, but you know more, you have more experience. Well, yes and no. Because if you are going to rely on the automatic ranking, then you're really falling into the trap of toxic power. I mean, if knowledge becomes a commons, then literally everybody counts. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, I remember now and then, uh, Mbuti would be coming outside of the forest and looking for things that they needed. And I remember people telling me, with great respect about them, you know, these people, these people really know a lot about nature. It was not contempt, as in fact, once it happened, I think, I can't remember when it happened, I mean, in Brazzaville, I can't remember when, but they organize a festival music, a music festival, sorry. And they invited pygmies, Mbuti, Batwa. And where did the Congolese government put these Batwa? Not in hotels, in the 
in, in the zoological garden in Brazzaville. You heard it right. I think it was in 207. In other words, in this continent, the practice of basically using power to dehumanize, to destroy, is very widespread. And I think you're right. I mean, you know, the, if you are going to decolonize, you have to understand what colonization was really about. And not just simply from the books. Right? Because as, you, as you said, yes. I mean, and, and as uh, Professor Wamba said, Ernest Wamba said, <laughs> it's on both sides. And how does that happen? You see, this is why somebody like Obama went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was unable to apologize. Because the, the equation of power is that if you acknowledge that you have been wrong, that is a sign of weakness. And that is forbidden. And yet, that is what has to happen. Now, how does one do that? How does one translate that into actual processes? Because there are going to be processes. It's not going to happen, you know, instantly. And I think, again, the two of you have said, yes, it's a process. Um, yeah. But that's, thank you. I mean, I, I don't think I have to say or disagree. I mean, I think that, yeah, the, the, the process of the way of companions as Aikwe talks about. I think it's even, the way of companions, I think is even better than a, a knowledge commune because a knowledge commune triggers all kinds of thinking, you know, the Paris commune and whatnot, and then people begin to say, but how do you do that? But it's the same idea. We, are, we all can contribute to the knowledge of how to stop the humanization of humans. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to Jacques. Thank you. There will be lots of opportunities formally and informally for further engagement in the next few days. Um, thank you. We, um, because it's late and the caterers uh, still have to clean up once we've eaten and, and they still have to get home to their families, it's 9 o'clock, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion that uh, people get their dinner and come back to the table, and then we can finish off with the, the last two performances that we have from the artists. It's unfortunate that we started late, but um, if, if people, I think there are two service stations, one on either side, uh, please get your meal and come back and uh, be entertained. Thank you.